Right, so we'll continue with uh, looking at the, the context from the Sermon on the Mount for studying prayer as a whole and keep on kind of touching on what's really right at the center of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, and that is his teaching on the Lord's Prayer, uh, which you find in Matthew 6, starting around well, at verse 9. Um, and we'll, we'll begin with uh, that and keep on going today. We kind of quickly went over at the end of last week's session. Uh, and then we'll finish up our context and we can get to the other bullet points on the sheet from there and just start talking about prayer more specifically, but with the kind of mindset that Jesus is instructing us to have in the Sermon on the Mount. So just very, very quickly, he made some comments beginning at chapter 6 about you know, being careful about things like hypocrisy and, and doing things just to be seen by other people or to gain their approval or maybe in our minds to gain God's approval, using the right kind of words in prayer. And, and his comment on that in chapter 6 was uh, verse 7, don't keep on babbling like the pagans do. They think they'll be heard because of their many words. It's not about that. It's about where the heart is at. And, and again, picture a little child, a toddler coming to mom and dad and, and just pouring out their heart to someone they can trust. And, and that's the idea behind prayer here. Uh, and so they're not concerned about having the right vocabulary. Vo See, I can't even say the word. <laughs> vocabulary or the right uh, diction or language or whatever. They're concerned about communicating their heart's need. Uh, and that's what prayer gets at too. Now, by giving us this context from the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is really very clearly summing up the, the teaching he provides in the way he structures the Lord's Prayer, or what we call the Lord's Prayer. Uh, but that doesn't mean that's the only way you can pray. It is, however, a very helpful insight to see how Jesus taught people to go about the task of prayer in the example prayer that he gave, that great prayer he gave, the Lord's Prayer. Uh, so, we have struggles, uh, and they're the normal struggles that come to people who, who struggle with sin from day to day and have the need to have their hearts and minds renewed by God's Word and Spirit. Prayer itself, like everything else we live under, is impacted by the spiritual battle that goes on inside of us and because of uh, the influences of the world around us upon us and Satan's influence and, and the battle always with the truth of God's Word. So because all of that is happening again, I felt the context was really very, very important here. Uh, so as we learn that truth, then we, we start to live better and more fruitfully with the tension of being a sinner who's still covered over with Christ, a sinner who's described as a saint because of what Jesus has done for us. And there's a tension in living that way where we're utterly, completely dependent upon our Lord's work for us, but then we're out in the world as His representatives. Uh, and, and the second we're out in the world as His representatives, what are we tempted to do? Gauge our performance level once again. And that's where the tension comes in. That's where the sinful nature crops up. So this complete dependence is a big, big part of Jesus' teaching on prayer. And that's why, again, Sermon on the Mount is so clear on that. So what I'd like to do as we begin today is I'll begin with prayer as normal. But then as I come to an end, I want to invite all of us to just join in the Lord's Prayer together. And let's begin that way, okay? Father in heaven, we thank you for your goodness to us. We pray with thanksgiving because we know that you are unchanging and faithful. Everything else in this life that's impacted by sin is like, uh, as your word reminds us, shifting shadows or shifting sands. But you call us to build our lives upon you, the rock and the fortress of our salvation. So we pray that we would be open to hear your word and spirit today and that we would then go forward with the kind of peace and hope and confidence that comes from knowing you. So we begin today as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All right. So thank you for doing that and for helping us open that way. Um, I, I got to admit I had my eyes open a crack as we were praying and I was reading the Lord's Prayer from Matthew uh, chapter 6 in my Bible to help me focus a little bit more. And of course the immediate thing that, that caught my attention is how I learned it in King James English. And you know, and I think probably most of us around the table did, and man is it hard to pray it any other way. <laughs> but it is helpful while praying it in those words to look at the words that are here. So let's begin with that today. Matthew 6 verse 9, Jesus says, this is how you should pray. And he's just said, don't be babbling and, and thinking it's all about the words. Don't be making a show of it. This is a heart-to-heart -heart conversation, you and your dear Heavenly Father. He begins by saying, our Father in Heaven. And again, like I said last week, remember what a mind-blowing thing that was for Jesus' hearers, especially Matthew that's written to a Jewish audience more than anything else. To call God Father? You didn't even speak His name. Remember how in the Old Testament, when the Hebrew letters for the name of God, the proper name of God occurred, they would change the vowels so that it would be something else. And they would know what they meant, but at least they wouldn't be saying the name of God because it was too holy to speak. And, you know, that's a sobering thought, and that's not entirely a bad thought, is it? But then we remember that Jesus taught us to talk about the Holy One, the Sovereign Lord, the Lord of hosts, and call Him Abba, Father, Daddy, right? That's remarkable too. So our Father in heaven. From the get-go, that understanding says, I'm now free. I'm in a safe place to pour out my heart. None of us who have been fathers on earth have done it perfectly. None of us who have had fathers on earth <laughs> have had perfect fathers. But imagine now what the perfect father would be like and how you could pour out your life to that person and how they would have your best interests at heart all the time. That's the idea Jesus communicates as he teaches us to pray. So whether we're using these words or not, wow, is it ever helpful to start with that understanding of who I'm talking to. And that's why that acronym for prayer acts always starts with A, adoration. Remember who you're talking to. He's pretty amazing. And he wants to hear from you. Those two ideas put together are very inviting, aren't they? that this is what I get to do. All right, so hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And again, as we talked about last time, I'll ask a question once more. Is God's kingdom going to come whether I ask for it or not? Is his name going to be hallowed whether I ask for it or not? Is his will going to be done whether I ask for it or not? And the answer to all three questions is yes. But what are we praying for here? Yeah, that, that we'd be part of it, that it would also come to us and through us to other people. You're back in confirmation class again, aren't you? And, and so while it's going to happen anyway, we want to be part of that kingdom. We want His will to be done in our life. Uh, and that's a reminder, if we've begun the prayer, reminding ourselves who we're talking to and how dependable He is and how amazing He is, why wouldn't I want His will to be done in my life? He's shown me He's faithful and trustworthy. Before I was even born, He paid for all my tomorrows. Why wouldn't I want His will to be done? And you see what we're saying is, when you stop and really think about the phrasing that Jesus taught us to use, whether you use those words specifically or not isn't really the point. But the point is, the idea behind them is very important and it helps fuel our prayers. Is there anything wrong with, oh Lord, please help? No. You know, uh, when, when I'm driving along down the freeway and there's black ice and suddenly I'm sliding sideways down the road at 120 kilometers an hour, not that I would ever go that fast, <laughs> um, that's probably the time for, oh Lord, help, right? And by the way, I don't bow my heads and fold my hands at that point either. I'm holding on to the wheel. But the, the point of it all is, if that's all our prayers ever are, we're starting to miss out. And in this world where we struggle 
with the sinful nature inside of us that, that keeps telling us, you got to measure up, you got to perform right, God isn't answering the way you think he should because you're not doing A, B, C, and D. In a world where we struggle with those kinds of thoughts and the devil likes to get us down that road of discouragement, so important to begin our prayers with, let me use this word, reality, truth. And what's the reality? God is good and he loves you and he knows everything about you. The very hairs of your head are numbered, you're carved on the palm of his hand. And if we start our prayers that way, then I'm going to want his kingdom. I'm going to want his will. I'm going to want to give thanks to his name. Now, by starting my prayer that way, there's a number of things that have happened. I've given God at least a smidgen of the honor that he's due, haven't I? It's far from perfect, but it's moving in the right direction. And in doing that, I've also been raised up in the sense that I... I'm reminded I'm his treasured child. And this God who's so amazing and marvelous suffered hell for me. So I'm raised up and, and I'm given a, a, a taste of the new life that's mine because he's real and he's there. And so now I'm more ready to really have a good talk with him. You see what I'm saying? So I'm saying this deliberately tongue-in-cheek it's almost like Jesus knew what we were like. Of course he did. And, and so I think that's one of the reasons he taught us to pray in this way. And it's only at that point that we get to this, uh, to, sorry, to verse 11, give us today our daily bread. You know, the prayer doesn't begin with that, does it? And again, you know, when you're in the middle of an emergency situation, you're at the bedside of a loved one in the hospital, you're, you're having to make a split-second decision about something life or death, <clears throat> nothing wrong with, oh, Lord, help. But what we're talking about here is the more day-to-day -day life of prayer. And I'm more ready to say, give me this day my daily bread and trust him to do what's best for me when I've remembered who he is, how much he loves me, and that his faithful character is unchanging. Then I'm more ready to ask. Do you see what I'm saying? And that's why that acronym for prayer, ACTS, always said, adore him for who he is. Confess your need before him. Thank him for what he's done about that. That's A-C-T. And then the S is the word we don't use as much, supplication. But we needed an S word, so we use supplication. And that's the asking, right? That's the requests. But they come on the heels of, well, verses 9 and 10, remembering who we're talking to. So daily bread, what does it involve? Everything, right? Uh, and I'm kind of preaching to the choir in this room and probably the people watching online too, but let's make sure we're clear. Does that mean that I just sit back and wait for it to parachute out of the sky? I mean, no. One of the ways God gives us our daily bread is by giving us abilities and the brains to use them uh, and other people in our lives to work with and to have uh, a communication with and to come to compromises with, oh, don't you love that? And to have serious discussions where we can work out differences and work together with, that's all part of his giving our daily bread, isn't it? And it is important to remember that because where two or three are gathered in the Lord's name, you have two or three different opinions, right? You've got two or three different sinners. Uh, and so it's, it's important for us as we gather together as Christians to do what that early church did and recognize we are in the hands of the faithful one. How are we going to act if that's true? And that's going to affect how we look towards our daily bread and our choices for what's needful in life as well, right? Um, does God answer every prayer? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, his answer might be yes, right? His answer might be no, or his answer might be wait. The latter two are our least favorite for obvious reasons, right? And maybe wait is even worse than no, uh, when, when it seems like nothing's happening. But that again is why it's so important to remember who you're talking to. At the end of the Old Testament, there is a wonderful section in uh, one of those prophets that we often overlook right at the end. Uh, and uh, it comes in um, 
Oh, let me just see here. Sorry, I got to find the right one. Of course, I didn't have the page marked. Yeah, I thought so. In Malachi, uh, where, where God's people are, are just asking question after question, and why aren't things working the way they should, God? And Malachi is bringing the questions to God, and it's as though there's this give and take between God and his people where they're saying, where God is saying, you've deserted me. And they're saying, how have we done that? And God's saying, you're, you're not trusting me. And God, they're saying, how have you done that? And, and uh, it's as though they're missing the first part of that prayer, remembering who they're talking to. Because if the almighty, all-powerful, all-loving one looks at me and says, Mark, I think you have a concern here that you need to pay attention to. Should my response be, oh, you don't know what you're talking about? Or should it be, huh, maybe I'd better think and pray hard about that. It should be the latter, right? And so, you know, there's all kinds of examples, Old Testament and New, where, where that kind of thing comes to the forefront. And there's other things from the prophets too, like where is it that we read, and I'm, I'm drawing a blank right now, um, even though, oh, it's Habakkuk, uh, even though the, um, the grain, the crops aren't being produced and there's no, uh, there's no uh, uh, herds that are healthy or well, I'm still going to rejoice in the Lord. So even though he's not answering my prayer and I'm in the waiting period, and it seems like he's being silent, I'm still going to trust in him. Why? Because of who he is. And so again, a couple of just little examples of how that first part, remembering who you're talking to, becomes so very important in our life of prayer. Does that make sense? Otherwise, has your experience in life been like mine? You talk to other people about things that are really, really important, and very often, I'm, I'm just overgeneralizing for the sake of making the point, okay? It's not always like this, but very often you'll get the reply, yeah, 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 that's right, and this is what we'll do, blah, 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 and then what happens? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> it just gets forgotten, right? And, and we need to be cognizant of the fact that when we talk to God, He's not forgetting stuff. So remembering who we're talking to, that leads us up to the give us this day what we really need. And if his answer is no, that's going to be for our best. If his answer is wait, you might not like it, but that's going to be for the best too. And I can tell you, I have had the experience in my life of being able to see in some instances where wait was really a beautiful answer that produced beautiful outcomes. Sometimes I'm kind of left going, huh, that's what God knew was best. I don't get it. And you are too, right? Maybe some of that is because His time is not our time. His time's not our time, right? And as the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, declares the Lord. So we've got to remember who we're talking to again. We're saying the same thing, aren't we? All right, so we've got to the give us this day our daily bread. It involves everything, including the people, the abilities, the, the, the brains God gave us, uh, all the other resources he's blessed us with on this earth, and he's blessed us richly. Uh, and, and again, I would just say before I move on, in our very well-off, comfortable Western culture, let's work hard at not forgetting that. Because when we're really well-off and blessed, what also gets ramped up? our expectations, right? Uh, and, and suddenly, you know, we, we forget. And, you know, I'm, I'm saying that because, you know, as we're recording this, this coming Sunday's Thanksgiving, uh, and I think it's a great opportunity for Christians because, you know, we know who we're thankful to. Uh, and, you know, you know how the, the tradition you see everywhere is, okay, we're having Thanksgiving dinner, let's go around the table and say what we're thankful for. That's, that's great. I'm not saying that's a bad thing at all. But my question is, who are we thankful to? Are we just thankful in general or, or what? And, and I think it's a real opportunity for us to be lights in a dark place. Anyway, um, so from that point on, where does Jesus go? Forgive us. What I learned was our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. That's the language I learned it in. But here's one place where I really appreciate the more modern language. 
forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And I, I really like that much, much better because transgression sounds like a really churchy word that a pastor would use, right? Debts, what does that sound more like? What you understand and experience in day-to-day -day life? Well, guess what? <laughs> Do I owe God a debt? Yeah, he made me. He made me to be his person, his creation, living in his creation to fulfill his purposes and to be in relationship with him. And guess what I like to do? I like to act like I owe nothing to nobody. Right? Yep. Comment? Are trespasses and debts the same thing? What do you think? Trespasses and debts are the same, th are they the same thing? I just, the translation, you know, one of the translation is because Let, to me it doesn't seem to be the same thing. The literal translation is debts. That's the, the language that's used. It's a financial term. Uh, and so debts is what I'd, where I, where I would have to land uh, as the best translation because that's literally what it says. And that, again, for me, I think is helpful because it helps me to see every day that, you know, I don't like to have debts. I like to be free. <laughs> well, and that's biblical because you're not supposed to borrow. Yeah. You're supposed to lend because God blesses you. Right, and that's living a life of faith then, isn't it? Yeah. And if I'm living the life of faith perfectly, I would be free. <laughs> I would be free to give and free to live and free. But I'm not because who am I concerned with first and foremost by virtue of my sinful nature? Me, right? And that's the other that's side of it, right? Of it. Yep, that's the other side of it, where debts could be limited to only money. So it's good to have the different translations, right? Mm -hmm. And that's one example of where we can look at our English Bibles and see how they're translated slightly differently and we get a fuller picture. That's a great point. Mine says wrongs. Our wrongs. Okay, so we've got three different words here now and they each add something to the puzzle, right? Mm -hmm. I don't like to be told I'm wrong. How about you? <laughs> And yet I'm, I was wrong once. <laughs> and it, it was when I thought I was never wrong. <laughs> you know? And so I'm wrong a lot is the point. And, and you know, the, the, so we've got wrongs. We've got transgressions, a broader term. We've got debts where we might be thinking more material or financial things. But all of them add to the well, equation. Debt could also be time. Debt could be time as well, a debt of time that's yeah. owed to someone, right? And, and so all of those put us in a position where unless we know we are absolutely cared for perfectly, we might be worried. But are we absolutely cared for? Yeah, and that's the struggle to remember. And again, why it's so important to begin the prayer remembering who you're talking to. His character, his nature, he doesn't change. I'm going to keep coming back to that. Um, the other thing I'll throw in right here, because it kind of comes into the conversation, is um, I'll mention it again later, but when we get to the end of the prayer, it talks, Jesus talks about if you forgive men when they sin against your heavenly Father, I'm sorry, so when you sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. The word sin there is trespass, literally. And what that literally means is stepping over the line. And maybe that's the broadest understanding we can bring into every area of this whole conversation. When I step over the line, I am taking, trying to take the place of God. Whether it's in the use of my time, my material possessions, my opinions, my attitudes, my choices, whether it's someone who's hurt me or someone that I've hurt, if I deal with any of those situations by putting me first, I'm stepping over the line. And, and that's really what's behind all of this here. Now, that's a pretty broad accusation that leaves me feeling a little defensive unless I remember who I'm really talking to here. That he's almighty, all perfect, but also all loving. And you know what? He knows everything that's going through my mind and heart right now. And yet he's committed to me anyway. Then I'm safe. 
then I'm safe to be more of a person who, and, and I'll just excuse the air quotes, takes a chance. Because I'm not taking a chance on God, he's dependable. But it feels like you're taking a chance and stepping out in faith, in the worst sense of the word faith, where it's like going off the edge of a cliff. But Christian faith's never like that, because it's placed in someone who's utterly and completely dependable. Sorry, but keeping you waiting. The thing of trespass, too, in the, you talk about sin and trespass on land. It's like entering the land without prior consent. Yeah. So it's that whole thing about communing with God, having a relationship with God so that we're not trespassing. And if we're having a relationship with God, we're going to walk His ways, not just yeah. blah. Over. And the, the blessed <laughs> truth is that we were made to have that relationship with Him, weren't we? So what God is trying to do is bring us back from the trespass of saying, prodigal son in Luke 15, Father, I wish you were dead, I want the inheritance now, to take us back from that trespass into what we were made to be in the first place, His treasured possession. And I want to say that very slowly and deliberately so that maybe it can sink into this thick head. His treasured possession. Okay. All right, so we've got forgiveness, and we'll come back to that at the end of the prayer because Jesus comes back to it, and I find that interesting in itself. Don't you think he has to do that because that's where we struggle the most? And so he'll come back to that, but for now, uh, we reread verse uh, 12, and then verse 13, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us, and the NIV has, and I'd say quite correctly, from the evil one because that is the literal translation. Deliver us from evil is, is, you know, how most of us learn the prayer. Nothing wrong with that either, of course, but deliver us from the evil one reminds us who's really behind it all, right? And that, there's value in knowing who's behind it all. It's not a fatalistic world where something might happen and everything's just by chance. No, there's a Lord God who's above and beyond all of that. And he is at work working things together for the good of those who love him to shape them into the image of Christ his son. And even when people do things that he doesn't want to happen, to have happen to us or when we do them, he can still work them together you know, as we live and strive to walk a life of repentance and faith that seeks his face. So, you know, this isn't just a fatalistic thing where evil is out there. This is a being who wants to rip you away from your good father. And there's value in understanding that, right? So deliver us from the evil one. Well, and he's like a prosecuting attorney. So if you have not transgressed, yeah. he has no case against you. So and it's kind of all a neat little path. Like a prosecuting attorney. And as you said that, I was thinking persecuting attorney. <laughs> that too. Yeah. Maybe that too, right? Even better because he's yeah. not nice. <laughs> okay. So... You notice what's missing then, because verse 14 be continues then with talking about forgiveness. Jesus talks about forgiveness. So just so you're aware, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever, amen, isn't actually in the Bible anywhere. There's nothing wrong with it. That was added to the Lord's Prayer as it was being taught to new Christians. And my memory could be off here. I'm going to say within the first two centuries is when it came into common usage. Uh, and really, all it does is kind of remind you of where you began, that you're talking to the Holy One here, and His is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, because that's kind of where we started with, right? Uh, forever and ever. And what does Amen mean? It shall be so. So be it, yeah. Uh, it's a, a statement of confidence. One word in Greek that's a statement of confidence. This is the way it's going to be. So be it. Uh, it shall be so. So those things are, are not part of the scriptural text, but they are a helpful conclusion to the prayer because, again, it brings us full circle. So what do we got from the short prayer Jesus taught us, which in the Bible is about 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 4, what, five verses? And then let's add a theoretical sixth for the thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. So you got like a half dozen sentences sort of thing. Uh, and what does it really focus on? Remember who you're talking to. That's the beginning and the end. Remember his will and kingdom. They're coming. The train's coming down the tracks. But he's brought us onto 
Oh, I'm going to get schmutzy here. He's brought us onto his train of forgiveness, grace, and love. And that's where we want to stay. Amen. That's where we want to stay. So the middle part of the prayer talks about staying there. And I want to be the kind of person who forgives like I've been forgiven. And I want to be the kind of person who doesn't, uh, uh, who isn't easily swayed from my father by the tempter. Didn't really touch on that as much as I probably should have. Um, the, the Bible's very clear on this, so I'll ask the question, does God tempt anyone to sin? No. no. But he does allow tests to come into our lives, right? Like, uh, you know, with Abraham and Isaac, and he tested Abraham in a pretty, pretty dire way there. Sacrifice your son, right? But what was the point of that test to help Abraham see clearly how dependable God is? And so God's testing is to grow our faith, to refine us like gold or silver, to draw us closer to him. But he tempts no one. And the Bible's really clear on that. I love that test. I was just actually talking to someone about that yesterday uh -huh. because God said, please, Abraham, take your son, your only son. Yeah. He didn't say, get your arse on that donkey and get going. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he said, please. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, yep. It's like the benediction, the ironic one you yep. know, that you do every week. It's like he comes humbly on his knees. Please, here's my gift to you. And, and please take it. Yeah, and, and it's like, whoa. God models humility in manifold ways in the Bible. The Father, as well as the Son, and the Spirit too. But you know, the, the triune God models humility for us in, in so many ways, and that's one of them. Uh, you know, there's other examples from the Old Testament where he uses customs that were uh, common to, to the people of that day and age in that part of the world where he basically says, if I don't keep my promise to you, may the worst things in the world ever happen to me through the customs that they understood. And, and that's, so amazing. Can, can you picture any religion in the world that teaches you to clamber your way up to whatever God is envisioned to be, where that God would do something like that? Mm -hmm. I can't. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's how God reveals himself to us. And then of course in Christ his son is the clearest example of that, right? And that was one of the comments about the NIV. They didn't put the word please in the New Testament. No. In various occasions that just diminish that thought. Yeah, uh, and, and I think they're, they're, it's always helpful to be able to look at texts that help us understand that. And one of the blessings of living in this day and age is if you have no knowledge whatsoever of biblical Greek or Hebrew, you can still check some of these things out and you can tell if the pastor's blowing smoke or not. You go to some of the online resources, like one of them is Bible Hub, and there's Greek and Hebrew interlinear Bibles there that have the Greek or the Hebrew and the English underneath, and all the verb forms are listed, and you can take your mouse and hover over the verb form, and you can tell if it's, if it's a, an imperative, like a command, or, or if it's an indicative that's just a state of being. And you might have to brush up on your, your terminology from English classes in high school, but there are so many resources to help us with that now. And that's one of the blessings of living in this day and age. Those guys going to seminary now have it so easy. <laughs> I had to walk hill up both, both ways in the snow with my Greek and Hebrew Bibles and translate it by hand. And you know, now they can just do it on their phone. It's like um, class. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I'm sounding my age, so let's go on. So Jesus then, he teaches this great prayer. And it's about trust in the unchanging Father. And after he does that, what does he focus in on again? I alluded to this before, but, and I think it, it'll be clear to us all why. Verse 14, For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Yikes! How do you feel about that one? That's hard, isn't it? So let's make sure we're clear on a few things. And I've said this to you many times, you need to say it again. This is not Jesus saying, feel good about it when someone does something really rotten to you. Forgiveness has nothing to do with how you feel about the situation. My sin, Jesus has never and never will feel good about that. It hurts him to this day. Tomorrow, 
I was going to say if, but I'll say when. Tomorrow, when I act in ways that, that are sinful and treat God like he is a liar and not dependable. Because that's what sin really does, right? And I find that kind of a sobering thought once in a while too. When, when I get really amped up and anxious and everything's out of control and oh, I don't know. Whatever, what am I really saying to God? You're not up to handling this. And I don't really think I want to say that to God. So that's kind of a, a, a pullback for me personally. Uh, so uh, Jesus understands these things about us. He understands that that's a struggle. And so we need to understand from the get-go that just like Jesus chose to win our salvation by paying hell for us when he hung on that cross, this is what's behind forgiveness for us. Lord, I don't like what happened. I'm mad at whoever. But you died for them just like you did for me. And before you, we are both beggars. And I know you've given me the gift of forgiveness, even for how I'm feeling right now. And I want to thank you for that. Maybe that's the best place to start because now instead of pointing the finger, I've, I'm considering more the three pointing back at me, right? Uh, Linda, you reminded us of that a couple of weeks ago. and I'm, I'm dwelling more on the three pointing back at me first. And that's probably a more healthy starting point. Now help me to treat that person like someone Jesus loves too. Because does Jesus love that person? Yeah. There's no way around it, right? Uh, I, I've always thought to myself, I've actually seen these and, and I could never do it because I'm a pastor. <laughs> I've seen t-shirts, I've seen t-shirts that say, Jesus loves you, but I'm really struggling. <laughs> and, and maybe someday. <laughs> but, you know, we laugh at that because we know it's true, right? It's hard. Uh, and, and the point is, Jesus gets right back to, out of all the things mentioned in the Lord's Prayer that he taught, what does he get right back to? Where we're going to struggle the most, forgiveness. So let's break it down a bit. If you forgive men when they sin against you, okay, I, I'm mad, I don't want to, they have trespassed, that means they've stepped over the line, they've definitely overstepped, and, and it's not right, and I'm mad. And, and by the way, tell God that, he knows it anyway. Don't try and holy up your words and sanctify them somehow by justifying how you feel. Just tell him how you feel. He knows it. But then, then remember how he treats you. Uh, and, and so your heavenly father forgives you, Jesus goes on to say. And I, I want to struggle to make the choice to treat this person like your, like a person Jesus died for right now, like someone you love, like your creation. But if I don't do that, if I refuse to do that, verse 15, then what am I also saying? How can I withhold something from someone else that God has poured out upon me so lavishly? You know, it's like Jesus' parable of the unmerciful servant. He's forgiven a debt, not, not given more time, but has a debt canceled that he could never hope to repay and then has his neighbor thrown into jail, giving him no chance to repay over the 10 bucks he owes him. I don't want to be that person. And so, you know, this is a prayer of humility. And again, how did the prayer start? You are the perfect father. You know all things. Your kingdom's going to come. And I want to be on the right side of that kingdom. And part of my thinking on being on the right side of that kingdom is remembering how much I need the forgiveness you've won. And I didn't really dwell on that before when we were talking about it, right? But that has to come in now too. And if I'm dwelling on the forgiveness that I've been blessed with, I'm going to be more ready to be forgiving. And when I read Jesus' words in verses 14 and 15, I'll be more ready by the power of his word renewing my heart and mind to say, Okay, I'm going to treat that person like someone Jesus died for because I'm no different. <laughs> and even if I have to say it like that, God knows the feelings is my point. But put it to you this way. For those who've had children or grandchildren, for those who've had pets, 
for those who've had anything that they were responsible for, that sometimes treated you like you were just in the way. You might be angry and upset with them, but do you still choose to do what's best for them? That's kind of what we're talking about here, isn't it? That's a, a, a parent's love, you know, a father or a mother's love for their child. And that's God's love for you and me. He will see, and he sees anyway, the struggle that's going on inside. But man, when I want to do what is appropriate in spite of the struggle and the feelings, as a parent and your child did that, wouldn't that make you proud? At the maturity and the, the integrity that they're exhibiting? And that's what makes God's heart swell as well. So... <laughs> Tell me about what that means. Well, let's, let's, so the, the question was about, yeah, and that's a common saying, right? You can forgive, but you don't forget. Um, first of all, let me say this. I understand why that's a common saying. It's hard to forget, isn't it? And when, sorry? It's impossible. In a lot of cases, it sure seems impossible, right? Unless you've got dementia. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, unless you got dementia. So I'm going to, maybe I'm coining a new term here. Maybe what I need is Christian dementia that forgets the things I should forget. All right, forgive but not forget. Yeah, it's hard to forget something that's hurt you deeply. If you refuse to forget and just keep willfully hanging on to it, you know the answer to this, but I'll ask it anyway. Who gets hurt? You do, as well as the other person, right? So it's for your own good that you ask God to help you let go of it. And it'll happen just like that in three seconds flat. No, probably not. But you ask Him to keep helping you strive to let go of it. And I'd suggest that one of the ways that's going to happen is as you and I learn to recognize more and more clearly how God's grace has won every breath that we take for us because I have offended him in ways too numerous to count and he chooses to forget his sins are separate sorry he says your sins are separated from you as far as the east is from the west he remembers them no more and that's the goal we're working towards so if you're struggling with forgetting keep asking God for help with that and, and don't just sit there and feel guilty about it, but don't nurse it along either. I've been keeping you waiting. Oh, Sorry. That's okay. I just, because I looked up those passages. Oh, okay. Recording them. There was one from Isaiah where God says, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. And then in Hebrews, he says, for I will be, be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. Okay. So God is saying he will not remember our sins. But my question then, too, is uh, when we read other passages about being accountable on the day of judgment, so yeah. what does that mean then? If God has wiped out and forgotten our sins, what is the accountability? Like, are, we're just recognizing our sinfulness in His presence? Okay, or good question. Other comments first before? Okay. Well, it says He forgives everything, doesn't it? I'm sorry? He yeah. says He does forgive yes. everything. Yeah. Yes. But then well, there's two separate what events, right? Because you're forgiven, but he still wants to know what you did with your time, but, talent, and treasures. Yeah, which he knows already. Yeah. Uh, and, and I get where you're going with that. You're still accountable to the master for how you've used your time, talents, and treasures, like Jesus' parables point out. Yeah. But let's throw this into the mix and just see if this helps us to sort of get a grip of what's going on. I think the bigger question is, what's the purpose of the Day of Judgment? And I'll come back to that, but I don't want to cut you off here first. I think, to me, it, it's saying that you have to be accountable and admit that you are, were a sinner and you did wrong. Even, I mean, he's forgiven, and you yeah. have to acknowledge that he's forgiven you. Mm -hmm. To me, I don't think he's going to bring up you did this, 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 eh? Yeah. That's, that's how I interpret it. He so, the account... The accountability on the Day of Judgment, I think your, your answer, Linda, is kind of playing into what I was going to say too, has more to do 
with all of creation acknowledging God's grace and goodness before all of creation. Uh, and in order for that to happen, how are we going to see God's goodness and His grace most clearly in how He dealt with we who are guilty? And the accountability is, yes, recognizing one, I, I'll put it in past tense for me because I've been a Christian since I can remember. You know, I was born with a need. And Jesus answered that need. I was born with a sickness. And Jesus provided the cure for that sickness through his payment for my sin on the cross. I keep going through periods through my life from day to day where that sickness rears its head again and again and again. But his cure is always there to deal with it, to cover it over and to wipe it clean again. And, and that happened once for all when Jesus said it is finished. It's not him saying, okay, uh, you've done this one more time. I'll let it go just this time, but don't do it again. You know, anything that, that brings into the equation fear isn't God's point. Because when Jesus said it is finished, literally that was paid in full, he meant it. Okay? So the judgment day then is a public acknowledgement before all of creation of what's already happened for the believer on this side of eternity when they are brought to faith. And for the person who rejects God's gift as well. Uh, and that's the sad part that should keep us working towards helping people seek who God really is as they see bits and pieces of Him through our life of, of hope and confidence. So I've used the example many times that I think a couple of things that will blow my mind on that day are are these, how deeply sin has impacted my life. And I think that will be clear, but not in the sense that it leaves me going, oh, but in the sense that it lets me see with wide open eyes how beautiful Jesus' forgiveness really is. Uh, and I think that's part of that accountability as well. So it's not, you know, God's not going to read through a list. I don't think that's going to happen. But Am I accountable to him? And even for how I used once I'm a believer, my time, talents, and treasures. Yeah, because you know what? My very best efforts are still tainted with sin, right? And so I, I remain on my own a lost cause, guilty. But that's part of the accountability. What does God have every right to expect from me? Utter and complete allegiance. He has every right to expect that. He made me. And I don't provide that. So, you know, the accountability is really giving honor and glory to God for what He's done in spite of who we are. Sorry? It's that darn apple. It's that darn apple. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, apple does that help? Does that help get at it? Though, we are to, him, yeah. But like, I guess in, we, as humans, we, it's like Hilda said, it's impossible to actually completely forget. But I guess the point is we're supposed to not keep dredging up. And, and that's why I said we shouldn't be willfully trying to keep dredging it up. I've had things come out of the blue from 20 years ago. And I kind of go, oh, that sure <laughs> made me mad. But then I need to choose to ask God to forgive me, to remember he's forgiven whoever was involved, and to move forward and deal with them like a brother or sister, especially if they're a believer, a brother or sister in Christ, right? Because the thing, they'll keep popping up, but that's different from, I'm not going to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Say, 20 years ago, does that mean that I really didn't forgive? No, that means you're human, and like the rest of us, you're a sinner. <laughs> because, like you said, yeah. part, you do remember yeah. some of these things, and you think, wow, I'm ever glad that's yep. over with, right? It doesn't bother me, but you do. But remember this, too. Even our very best efforts are going to be tainted by sin. And so things like that, which 
probably aren't part of our very best efforts. They show our sinfulness. They crop up too. But Jesus paid for that already. And that's an opportunity for me to say, thank God he sent Jesus. And then to look at what happened 20 years ago or whatever the case may be and say, I need to remember what Jesus said here and how much he's forgiven me. Help me do that. And to ask for help again. I know somebody was, Linda? Would, I was told once, you know, with that question yeah. in the study, and they said, if you're not thinking about it all the time, hmm. it's not, like you said, if you're not, it's not grudging you forever and ever. And you, you do eventually forget, but forget it. But because God gave us such a good memory, too, <laughs> he's given us so much, eh? Yeah. That it is, like you say, 20 years later, it can come back. Yep. But it's not, you're not constantly thinking about it, angry about it. You've forgotten it's just because he's given us such a good memory bank. Yeah, okay. I think that's a fair comment. You know, that's, yeah. I, it was explained to me. Like yeah, I think that's a fair comment. Uh, and, and then it becomes more what you do with it when you remember. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. yeah. You, it, it hadn't been on your mind for 20 years, so you kind of had forgotten it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's a good comment. Yeah. Anything else? I wonder too, on that being accountability, when we feel the mountain of love, Okay, that's a really great comment. So in case you didn't hear, you know, when we, we experience and see the mountain of God's love on that day, are we going to feel inadequate and maybe guilty because we should have done more? Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, the, the bottom line truth, and let's get that off the table, is we should have done more, right? But the other side of that is, when I think that way, am I basing my relationship with my Lord upon what Jesus did for me in the mountain of his love or upon my response to it? I'm basing it on my response, aren't I? And that's where performance slips again in again. And what's and here's maybe the simplest way of getting at it. Um, what as Lutheran Christians, we talk about law and gospel. And what's the purpose of God's law? It's a curb, the way I learned it in confirmation. You know, it lets you go so far, no farther. tells you where he limits things. You know, you shall not kill, etc. It's a mirror. It shows what's going on inside that maybe shouldn't be there. And it's a rule to live by. Does it in any way save me? It just shows all the problems, doesn't it? and gives some limits to how far I can go. What's the purpose of the gospel? To show what God's done about the fact that the law can't save me. So the second we slip into the, oh, I should have done more, that's law thinking. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. And the second I'm thinking about my performance and how I did or did not measure up, where do I need to turn? To what Jesus already did. And so in a weird way, that thought that I see the mountain of God's love and it makes me think, wow, this is so great, I should have done more. All that does is remind me of the mountain of his love. Mm -hmm. And guess who gets praised? God does. And that's what he deserves. And that's really kind of the point to go full circle again of Judgment Day scripturally to show to all of creation that God is deserving of all glory, honor, praise. It's like Isaiah's vision of the heavenly throne room. And, and what are all the angelic beings doing? Their, their, their minds are just exploding with thanksgiving and praise for God. And I think it's really hard for us to picture that. But what you've just given us is another example of how that works, where it's like everything snowballs. And the more we see of our experiences and what happens, the more it just points out how amazing God is and the more He's praised. I'm going to be so, it's still going to be so awesome. I'm not going to think of what I did or didn't do because everything's going to be perfect then. We're not going to have all those things that we're just going to, ah, you yep. know. And that's the bottom line, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. It won't be a day of dread for the believer. And anything that impacts us, that shows us our sinful nature's shortcomings will only 
give us more praise and thanksgiving and joy in who God is because he did something about that before we were even aware we had a problem. So, you know, I, the bottom line is, and I think this is kind of what you're saying too, is all those other things that really won't matter that much. They won't matter at all. <laughs> apart, apart from Jesus, it would matter. But in Jesus, it won't matter at all. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. He got there. He said Jesus' love was so immense, so overwhelming. <clears throat> he got this sort of life review thing, and he's thinking in his head, "Oh, I blew it." <laughs> right? But he yeah. said Jesus just—he was like, "I love you, well done." And he's, and then he, he was yep. told he had to go back, right? But it was overwhelming how much he was still trying to judge himself. But Jesus was like. I don't see anything. I just, yeah. you know, I love you. And for people who've had those kinds of experiences and God allows them, wants them to be on this side of eternity for a time longer, that's invariably the message they come back with yeah. is how great is the love of the Father that we should be called children of God and that is what we are. Yeah. And, and that's why that statement is such a mind-blowing thing in the epistles, right? Uh, so, all right. We didn't finish the context, but we talked a lot about prayer. <laughs> uh, and, and that's okay, because uh, as we go through the rest of this, I still think it's really helpful to go through it, because it's all going to feed into our discussions of prayer. Next week, we're going to talk about not worrying about today and having treasures in heaven. And if I look around the table, can anybody say they've never worried about today? Yeah. <laughs> we're good at that, aren't we? Uh, and, and so that's a very helpful thing then to also feed our life of prayer. But can you start to see why Jesus put this teaching on the Lord's Prayer in the middle of the sermon? You know, remember who you're talking to. Remember how great and faithful he is. Because his hearers then, just like now, are having the same thoughts. What if? And, and I struggle with letting go of that. And, and so just like them, we need to hear what's real and what's real that we can base everything on is the character and nature of God our Father so let's strive to live like that's real and that's really a summary way of saying what the Christian life is about right? all right we're at two o'clock any final thoughts for the day I was just reading John 17 kind of thinking in line of the prayer and you know Jesus prayed to the Father don't take them out of the world just protect them mm -hmm. Yeah. He's, he's Protect them by your name. Even as he's going to go be crucified. Yeah. Like. So he's praying for us not to take them out of the world, but you know, just again want to emphasize the end of what you said. Protect them by your name. Your name and word is truth. Yeah. And and those are the things that we're talking about: the unchangeable word, the unchangeable name, the unchangeable character of God. Yes. Such good news. We covered new stuff. Five verses today. <laughs> Um, but we also sort of supplemented what we ended with last week. So we'll, we'll get there. I guess let's close there with prayer. Gracious Lord, who you are is beyond our complete understanding, but, oh, you give us such amazing glimpses of your nature and character in your word and in how you deal with your people in Scripture and in how you deal with us today. Where there is fear in our life anywhere, direct us to Jesus' cross, where we see with clarity who you are. And then help us to be people who call out to you as the perfect, loving, heavenly Father, with trusting hearts. Help us to seek your kingdom and your will, and may they be done in us. And then may we, with peace, with hopefulness, with joy, live lives that reflect our thanksgiving for who you are. We won't do that perfectly, but we look forward to the day when standing before you we will. And until then, we ask you to refresh and renew our hearts and spirits day by day. We ask it to your honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, pick up with verse, I guess, uh, six, no, sorry, 19 next time. Yeah.
There's a sound I love to hear. It's the sound of the Savior's robe as he walks into the room where people pray. Will he hear praises? He hears faith. Um, holy habits allow us to frame rhythms of life so that we can be in tune to God's grace. We're going to learn about how to resolve conflict. We're going to learn how to be shaped by scripture. We're going to learn how to rest. We're going to learn the holy habit of sharing good news. 
Our culture is devoted to speed, superficiality, and distraction. If you and I continue to run at the pace of light speed, we're gonna break our spiritual necks. Let's be intentional about God's grace and mercy. Let's be intentional about living in the rhythm of holy habits. You.